What is that familiar symbol of reaching for recovery? The faith in scientific progress and the vision of a cure for breast cancer. And of course, that can-do attitude. Well, the pink ribbon, of course. Well, join us tonight on Medically Speaking as we discuss Angelina Jolie's recent decision to have bilateral mastectomies. We'll be right back with you. Welcome to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, your host for the show. This show is sponsored to you for your good health by York County Medical Society and also the York County Medical Foundation. Well, tonight we're going to discuss how 37-year-old actress and activist Angelina Jolie had her mother die of breast cancer and subsequently decided to have both breasts removed in what we call a bilateral mastectomy. It really tells us that women who are facing high risk of developing breast cancer have some very difficult decisions to make. And even if you are diagnosed with breast cancer, there are many decisions that you and your surgeon will make to discuss how you're going to best manage your care. Well, joining us tonight is Dr. Heather Themey, and she is a board-certified general surgeon, and she's done a surgical fellowship in surgical oncology. Welcome back to our show, Dr. Themey. Thank you. Well, your expertise is cancer, and who mm -hmm. better to help us discuss this vital issue? What were the circumstances that actually led Angelina Jolie to decide to have both breasts removed? It seems like a, a very radical decision. It does. The decision to have her breasts removed and uh, also her ovaries was really because of what happened with her mother. Her mother died at a young age, and fortunately during the workup, of her mother and why she would have gotten this cancer, she received genetic testing. And genetic testing tells us what genes we have that might predispose us to certain conditions. And in this case, it's the BRCA genes. And BRCA actually stands for BRCA breast cancer. Mm -hmm. There's two that we test for, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, BRCA2 was what she had tested positive for. For any uh, patient, that it has a parent that tests positive for BRCA, they have a 50% chance of receiving those genes. In other words, one or two. In Angelina Jolie's case, when she was tested, she had in fact inherited those genes. So she knew that her breast cancer risk <clears throat> and her ovarian cancer risk were both much higher than they would be for your average woman without carrying those genes. Carrying those genes carries how much risk? It depends on which kind of BRCA. Both of them certainly increase your risk significantly over the general population. It's slightly higher for BRCA1 uh, in the 50 to 65 percent range that by the age of 70, a woman will develop breast cancer. And it's slightly lower than that for BRCA2, uh, more 45 to 55 percent range. For most people who have these genes, the, the, those numbers essentially mean I have a lifetime risk of developing breast cancer at least of 50 percent. Now when cancer is examined under the microscope, we diagnose it according to the type. There are different types of cancers within one particular tissue. And certain of these cancers are more aggressive or cancerous or malignant, if you will, mm -hmm. than others. Carrying the BRCA genes, does that mean that this particular cancer that the, the lady will develop is more aggressive or more deadly than some of the other breast cancers? It can, particularly for the BRCA1 genes. Uh, those patients are at higher risk for 
what we call triple negative breast cancers. And what that means is that uh, they do not test positive for the hormone receptors, which would be estrogen receptor, or ER, and progesterone receptor, PR. And we know that those are more treatable cancers when someone's positive for those. The other third component is whether they're HER2 new positive. And that's why we refer to these patients as triple negative if for the three common tumor markers that we know to test for, they don't test positive for any of those. We know that in general, women with the triple negative breast cancer is going to be less responsive to treatments. Is there any other way to manage the care of a person who tests positive for these particular genes? It seems like surgery is just such a radical decision. It is, and that actually absolutely has to be individually decided by the patient. Uh, the decision to go forward with surgery is very dependent on whether the patient can live with the close follow-up that they should receive to determine whether they're developing a cancer. Those so patients- more intensive, perhaps having a mammogram more often would be the approach? Correct. Correct. More close clinical follow-ups. Not only mammograms, but also ultrasounds uh, are often now used as part of the screening for breast cancers. And frequently those women will be referred to what we call a high-risk clinic. They have a known uh, predisposition to higher risk for cancer. So they have, there are clinics that are specially set up for these women or if there are any in the system with a surgeon, that surgeon would more closely follow them up for any signs that they were developing cancer. Now we all know that in this day and age, the driving force is cost in healthcare. Do insurance companies typically pay for genetic screening and who consequently should be considering genetic screening? Does every woman need it? Absolutely not. And in fact, most women will not have a genetic predisposition that's known who end up developing breast cancer. So a woman that does not have any family history of breast cancer cannot say, well, I don't need any testing or I don't need mammograms because I have no family history. The typical patient does not have a family history. Uh, As far as uh, the testing for genetics, We look at a family history to determine are there characteristics in their family background that make us think that there is something that is being carried in this family's genetic line that is increasing the risk for cancers. This can not only be more family members with breast cancer, but more family members with ovarian cancer. And in some of the BRCA carriers, this genetic mutation, there are other cancers that they are also higher risk for. For example, in BRCA2, malignant melanoma, which is uh, a skin cancer, and pancreatic cancer are more common. And in men, prostate cancer is more common. Also, in the families that are test positive for BRCA2, male breast cancer is more common. And so any family... Uh, that comes to me and has a male family member who was diagnosed with breast cancer, in my uh, own clinical estimation, should undergo genetic testing. Does insurance typically cover the cost of testing? If there's that family history and uh, that's been documented, typically, yes, an insurance company will cover the cost of the testing. The testing is quite expensive. And up until this year, there was only one company that was testing for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. They actually had a patent on the genes uh, that has now been overturned. And Myriad, who is the genetic testing company, no longer has the exclusive patent to those genes. So it's very likely that some of those testing costs will go down now that they don't have the corner on the market. But it is a very expensive test if not covered by insurance companies. Now, if a woman tests positive and considers all of her options and decides that she's going to be proceeding on with surgery, Mm -hmm. does insurance typically cover that procedure? When they test genetically positive, yes. That is covered by insurance. So the idea is that surgery removes the potential for developing cancer because you're removing that organ. It decreases the potential. What does that mean? If you have no breast tissue, that you can still develop breast cancer? That's correct. Uh, And that's one discussion that I always have with patients that want to undergo a mastectomy. 
women want to feel like they have completely removed that risk from their life. But actually, breast cancer risk after a mastectomy is still at 2%. It's not zero. So a patient who has undergone a mastectomy, if they felt a lump in the residual tissue, should not ignore that thinking, well, I had the mastectomy, I have zero chance of breast cancer. Certainly you have decreased it to as low as we can, but it's still not zero. It's pretty hard to eliminate all your risk. You also mentioned that they're more susceptible to ovarian cancer. I guess you could remove the ovaries while you're there. That is correct. Pancreatic cancer? Can't remove the pancreas, can you? I mean, you're getting rid of all your parts. Yes, uh, the pancreatic cancer risk is increased But the general population, pancreatic cancer risk is about 1%, and in a BRCA family, increases to 2%. So when we talk about an increase in the cancer risk, yes, that's a doubling of the pancreatic cancer rate, but certainly that's still a very low percentage. You mentioned that while it's uncommon, men may also develop breast cancer. Absolutely. How does that show up in a man? How would a man know that he's having a problem? Does he feel a lump? Yes, just the same as the way a woman might discover breast cancer. The difficulty in men is that many people are unaware that men can get breast cancer, and I've even run into that in families that have been tested positive for BRCA, Mm -hmm. that they were not aware that the men in their family also had increased risk. And the BRCA genes can be carried through the male line of a family. So yes, they, they would typically find a lump in the breast tissue And the difficulty in men is if they are not aware of their increased risk that we sometimes discover these breast cancers at a later later stage because a man wouldn't know or have it on their radar that this could potentially be a cancer. Uh, We've been doing a lot of screening testing lately in medicine in general. We do colonoscopies, Mm -hmm. we do PSAs, and Mm -hmm. uh, PSAs for prostate cancer have recently come under great scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And so too, true is, so too is true of mammography. Yes. Uh, what are the current recommendations? Depends on who you talk to. Mm-hmm. Well, so, there are some people, aren't there, who say, oh, it's just increasing the exposure to irradiation that a woman experiences, and the yield is really not all that great. Do we need to do mammograms at all? Let's start there. There's no question that mammograms detect breast cancer at an earlier stage than what we would see it by clinical detection before it's a palpable lump. So yes, there is value in obtaining a mammogram and it does decrease cancer deaths, which is the most important role that screening can play. The big controversy that occurred two or three years ago was at what age is it appropriate to start mammogram testing? Traditionally, we had started our recommendations at the age of 40 and then every year. And then a society said that's not cost effective. From the age of 40 to 50, it's not significantly decreasing the number of deaths from breast cancer and recommended starting screening at the age of 50. Uh, the, there's no question that even starting at the age of 40, you will find early breast cancers in women. So uh, it, it, it's a matter of looking at society's cost and supporting these screening mammograms and the cost of one woman being diagnosed with breast cancer at an earlier stage when it's more treatable. Now, what are your recommendations to patients as far as uh, mammograms, asymptomatic woman not having any problems? What do you tell them? I do recommend to start mammograms at the age of 40. I don't necessarily think all patients who have a low-risk personal history, a low-risk family history, needs to have a mammogram every year from the age of 40 on. But it's very useful to have that baseline mammogram, particularly if they would develop a symptom or, or if they get a mammogram two or three years ago. You have that comparison to see is this a change in the breast from that original mammogram that was taken? The well, time flies, and we're going to take a break. But when we return, I'd like to talk about surgical options, the things that a woman must consider, or even a man if he's having surgery for breast cancer. So please stay tuned. <laughs>
Welcome back to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, and I'm with Dr. Heather Themy. She is a surgical um, oncology specialist, meaning that she's done extra training in surgical oncology, combining that with her expertise in general surgery, and she is in private practice here in New York with White Rose Surgical, and we've been having a most uh, informative discussion about breast cancer. Let's start with the fact that a woman has an abnormal mammogram. Mm -hmm. What kind of a workup comes with that, and when does a patient actually start to get involved with you, the surgeon? The surgeon becomes involved typically when we want to start seeing uh, tissue from that abnormal mammogram. A mammogram can certainly suggest that there's a problem, but at the end of the day, the only way to determine whether someone has cancer or not is to take cells from that region, and then the pathologists look under the microscope to determine, are these cancer cells? So that so would be the biopsy. So you have an abnormal mammogram, mm -hmm. how about the ultrasound? Do you also get involved in doing the ultrasound? Yes, I'll do ultrasound in my office, uh, either because of an abnormal mammogram, and I try to correlate those findings with what I see on an ultrasound, which can give it additional information, or uh, frequently a patient will come to me saying, I feel something in my breast. And then in the office that day, I can evaluate with an ultrasound, determine if there's a lesion that does look suspicious, and then immediately proceed with a biopsy, meaning uh, taking a needle to take a sample of the suspicious area. So the ultrasound is obtained to give you more information about the characteristic of that lump, that's similar to the thyroid cancer you talked to us about whether the lump is actually a cyst or a solid. Correct. Can you call them nodules in the breast or just lumps? You can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the ultrasound will also help you to guide the biopsy. The, do you use fine needle aspiration, your FNAs again? Sometimes. It's sometimes clinically indicated. For example, uh, if, I have, if I have a patient that has implants, I might proceed with the smaller needle because I don't want to disrupt those implants if there's a lesion that I'm biopsying. Can a person who's had augmentation or buildup of their breasts actually get a normal mammogram or have a good study made of her breasts? Yeah, you can still follow those patients with mammograms effectively, and even patients that have had mastectomies with implants can be followed to some degree with imaging. So-called reconstructive surgery. Absolutely, yes. So now tell us a little bit more about that biopsy. So the biopsy is not done blindly. Uh, with the ultrasound, you can see where the suspicious lesion is, and then I can guide the needle under direct visualization to where that suspicious area is and know <clears throat> I'm sampling uh, the exact area that needs to be. That sample is then sent to the pathologist who can determine what is causing that abnormality. In some cases, that might be a completely benign finding, but that way you found it in a fairly minimally invasive way rather than doing surgery to remove a mass, which can cause scarring or disfigurement, as more for the patient to go through. Now, in the States, up until the 1970s, the standard treatment for a known cancer was a radical mastectomy. You took Correct. the breast, you took the lymph nodes, everything that was possibly in the area to uh, get rid of the cancer. And yet, much earlier, the Europeans were doing what we called breast tissue conserving surgery, or just breast conserving surgery. Uh, we've now adopted that, haven't we? We have, absolutely. And what does that mean to the patient? The, the main benefit to the patient is that the cosmetic disfigurement that used to occur, because there was not necessarily any reconstruction that was offered as part of that and in fact, the muscle was often removed as part of that surgery. So even the pectoralis muscle was removed as part of that radical mastectomy. Uh, that was a very disfiguring surgery. And uh, in that era, that was something that was considered the standard of care. However, when they started doing the research into patient survival, what they found is that with much sur smaller surgery, we could still give someone a very effective cancer treatment. And as the years have progressed, we've become more and more conservative on how much breast tissue we need to remove and been able to provide other treatments that can make removing a portion of the breast a safe and effective treatment. Now, what is involved in so-called lumpectomy? 
A lumpectomy is removal of just a portion of the breast that's involved with the breast cancer. It's still very important that the cancer is removed with what we call clear margins. And what that means is that at the edge of the mass that's removed, there are normal breast tissue or breast cells that we do not see the cancer extending all the way to the edge of the removed tissue. If you are able to get clear margins with the lumpectomy, there's no reason to proceed with removal of the entire breast if a woman is willing to undergo subsequent radiation treatment. Now, what does the radiation do? The radiation decreases the local recurrence rates of the breast uh, cancer. Although lumpectomy with radiation does have a slightly higher risk of local recurrence than mastectomy, the overall prognosis of those two patient populations is the same. And when do you decide to do the more aggressive mastectomy? Frequently, it's based on the patient's choice. So for some women, even if they have a small cancer and it is reasonable to offer lumpectomy, and I anticipate they would have a good cosmetic result from that, a woman may want to choose to decrease her cancer risk in that breast as low as she possibly can and wants to pursue mastectomy. In fact, in this country, we're seeing still fairly significant mastectomy treatments because women are driving that. They want to decrease that risk. They don't want to ever have to go through this again. Right. Now, uh, women often decide after surgery that they would like to have a more natural look, not just wearing padded bras. Mm -hmm. So they elect to have reconstructive surgery. Correct. What's involved in that, and how soon can that be done? A woman could wake up from a mastectomy surgery and already have the basis of her reconstruction in place. And uh, there are several options for how that reconstruction can be done. That's a plastic surgeon who performs that portion of the surgery. So when I perform a mastectomy with immediate reconstruction, that's in coordination with a plastic surgeon. That's important because my goal as a surgical oncologist is to treat the cancer. A plastic surgeon's goal is to make this woman feel beautiful and comfortable with herself again. And sometimes those goals can be somewhat opposing. So we work in conjunction, give the patient the information on what different reconstruction options there are, and then she chooses what she feels most comfortable with and what will be what she's willing to undergo as far as multiple surgeries, tattooing, uh, they're, the main reconstruction options are an implant, which could be silicone-based or saline-based, or a flap, which is where her own tissue is used to recon reconstruct the breast mound. Now, is insurance covering reconstructive surgery? Absolutely. Now, we've heard a lot about robotic surgery. Do you use robotics for this type of surgery? This, that would be very experimental. This is still the old-fashioned open surgery. Mm -hmm. It must be a very difficult thing for patients to adjust to. I mean, a breast has typically been a symbol of a woman's femininity and sexuality. Is there anything that you do to help a woman with this aspect of the surgery? Absolutely. Uh, not only me, but there's a huge support network uh, that is available to women when they have this diagnosis. And that's extremely important to put into place as soon as the diagnosis is made. For one thing, a lot of women like to meet women who've had the reconstruction option that they are considering because they can talk to someone who's undergone the same treatments. And it's one thing for me to tell a woman, this is what it's going to be like, this is what's going to be different for you. It's quite another for them to hear that from someone who's actually gone through it. So it's very important to make sure that they have those resources in place. Let's talk about length of hospital stays. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, with all kinds of surgery, hospital stays have been getting to be smaller and smaller and maybe non-existent. Correct. How do these forms of surgery fall into length of stay in hospital? Right. It's typically a patient that is just undergoing the lumpectomy or partial removal of the breast is not going to require an overnight stay in the hospital. And this can be done at an outpatient surgery center. Uh, for a patient that's undergoing a mastectomy, and particularly if they're getting some form of reconstruction at the time of that surgery, at least one night in the hospital is typical. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the risk factors for recurrence of breast cancer? It's 
very dependent on uh, if a woman has genetic predisposition to breast cancer, and it's dependent a bit on what kind of treatments she chose to undergo. Uh, the mastectomy definitely decreases local recurrence rates, but as I've mentioned before, that still does not decrease your risk to zero. That decreases it to approximately 2%. Lumpectomy with radiation treatment has a slightly higher right recurrence rate than mastectomy, but that can be treated, and that's why these patients need to be very closely followed. It's possible that after recurrence with lumpectomy, they might eventually need a mastectomy because of that slightly higher recurrence. Is your initial surgery more aggressive when there is the genetic predisposition? That's patient dependent. If a patient knows that they have a genetic predisposition, frequently the initial surgery will be removal of both breasts, even if we find cancer only in one of the breasts, because that way in one go, they are decreasing their dramat dramatically their breast cancer risk. But it is possible to offer those women a lumpectomy with radiation the more typical scenario would be uh, the mastectomy at that point. Now, if a woman uh, has no genetic predisposition, has a localized cancer in one breast, receives mm -hmm. her lumpectomy and her radiation, what are the chances for cancer developing in the second breast? We know that that increases their risk, not only of the kind of cancer they had, but of any kind of breast cancer, and that can be up to 15 to 20 percent. So those women are considered higher risk once they have declared themselves with that initial breast cancer. These patients need to be followed, and that needs to, they need to be followed for many, many years. And that's why it's so important to establish this relationship with the patient from the start, because they'll be my patients for a decade, two decades, because we need to make sure that a recurrence, if it occurs, is caught early and treated appropriately. Hence why you like to see them right from the get-go when they have the abnormal mammogram. Correct. It seems like we hear a lot about breast cancer. seems like all of us have been touched by somebody who has breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And yet, it really isn't a new disorder, is it? Not Described at all. Described long, long time ago. Yes, even in Egyptian papyrus, they, there are references to breast cancer. So. Occasionally, I'll have friends or patients say, you know, why is, why is everybody getting breast cancer now? And I think most of us at some point got the spam email forwarded to us that our neurom deodorant causes an increase in breast cancer and that it must be some modern phenomenon. But in fact, even back to 1600 BC, you can see references to women having breast cancer. The reason why this is not widely known or seen in the history books is it was completely untreatable. The references say she developed this lump in the mass of the breast and died. And I guess, too, we're a little more open in our discussions about Absolutely. organs that were considered to be private in the past. No question. This is much more discussed. The pink ribbon is a very recognized symbol of breast cancer. Women are very open about discussing this. And even 40 or 50 years ago, this would be looked upon as something to hide or something somewhat shameful. So no question, women are much more open and you're much more aware of it. Well, I want to thank you for coming on tonight and for all of your good work in our community. We thank you, viewers, for also joining us. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, ophthalmologist and retinal surgeon, wishing you good health, happiness, and a great week. We'll see you soon. Good night. Good night, Dr. Themy. Thank you very much.